Right, let's talk about writer's syndrome, or more specifically, why it's called writer's syndrome, or why it isn't called writer's syndrome anymore. There's quite an interesting story there, and I think that it also tells us a lot about how we look back on history, and look back on very unpleasant bits of history. This is no more leeches, this is no more Nazis. So first of all, what is writer's syndrome? Well, obviously it's a syndrome. That means that it's a collection of signs and symptoms. Writer's syndrome is a collection of uveitis, that's your eye, urethritis, that's your urethra going for a wee, and arthritis, that's your joints. We now know that it's a reactive arthritis syndrome. Reactive arthritis is inflammation of your joints and sometimes other things, so as we said here, urethritis and uveitis, which comes on as a reaction of your body's immune system to an infection, and that's why you get the inflammation. We could talk about reactive arthritis itself all day. That's not really the point for today. The point is that this syndrome used to be called writer's syndrome, and we don't call it that anymore. Why? Reiter's syndrome was named after Hans Reiter. Hans Reiter was a German doctor that wrote about this triad of uveitis, urethritis and arthritis. He wasn't the first person to write about what we now know as reactive arthritis. He probably wasn't even the first person to write about that particular triad, but he did write about it. He was one of the early people to talk about that triad that he noticed, and so it was later called Writer's syndrome. He didn't call it that himself. Then in the 70s there started to be a bit of a movement to stop calling it writer's syndrome and that's kind of caught on later. Now we tend to just call it reactive arthritis. Now the interesting thing is why did it change? As you might have guessed, Hans Reiter was a Nazi. Now he wasn't just a doctor that happened to live in Germany during the 1930s and 1940s. Hans Reiter was a card-carrying Nazi from the early 30s. He signed a Pledge of Allegiance to Adolf Hitler way before he could have had any excuse that he was forced to. It was definitely a choice. He was an SS officer. He literally wrote a book about eugenics, or as he called it, racial hygiene. <laughs> He was tried at Nuremberg where he at least admitted that he had knowledge of forcible sterilisation of people, of supposedly involuntary euthanasia. There's no such thing as involuntary euthanasia. If it's involuntary, it's murder. And he designed an experiment using concentration camp victims to test an experimental typhus vaccine, which ended up murdering over 200 of them. Now he admitted having knowledge of all of that, he was at least complicit, but in all honesty, reading between the lines, it looks very much like he had more than knowledge of it. What happened after the war is interesting as well, but that's another kettle of fish. So on the back of all this, in the 70s, there started to be this campaign saying that we shouldn't call it writer's syndrome because he was a Nazi and his theory as to what caused writer's syndrome, which he didn't name himself, was wrong. And also he wasn't even the first person to discover it. So he doesn't deserve to have it named after him. Now, as far as I can see, the Nazi thing is quite important. The second and third things, I'm not so sure about. And the idea of deserving to have something named after you is a little bit weird to me. So if we just sidestep a little bit. David Bowie has a species of spider, a species of wasp, and an asteroid named after him. Does David Bowie deserve to have those things named after him. I don't know how you'd even go about starting to think about that. Like, it just seems odd. David Bowie definitely did not discover that asteroid, and David Bowie definitely did not theorise about how and why that asteroid is there. I don't think that those things are related. If the people that get to name the asteroid decide that they want to name it after David Bowie, by all means do so. I have no problem with that, primarily because David Bowie wasn't a Nazi. He didn't write a book about eugenics. He made nice music. However, Hans Reiter did not make nice music, and even if he did, the fact that he was a Nazi would overshadow that. As an aside, David Bowie turned down a knighthood because he said that he didn't know why he was being awarded it and that that's not what he'd spent his life working for. The thought that we're then naming asteroids and spiders after him seems a bit weird, but by the by, I wonder what he'd think of that. I've got no idea. Anyway. 
But I guess the idea is that by naming stuff after people, you're kind of celebrating them and honouring them in a certain way. And we shouldn't be celebrating and honouring people who murdered concentration camp victims. Reactive arthritis probably is a better name medically because it tells us a little bit about what the condition actually is. So we can get rid of the name. But getting rid of the name completely, I do have some hesitancy about. We certainly don't want to be honouring Hans Reiter, but also we need to make sure that we don't forget Hans Reiter. Reiter's syndrome and the story of the naming and unnaming of Reiter's syndrome should serve us as a warning and a marker and a reminder of the atrocities that he committed and of the regime that he was part of and the complicity of people within that system. Which is why, in honesty, sometimes I do still call it writer syndrome, with the caveat of writer was a Nazi. Nazi arthritis is a bit of an inflammatory name for an inflammatory condition. And the syndrome formerly known as writers is a bit wordy, but probably does it justice. The other thing that I think is really interesting to point out here is that whilst Reiter clearly was an abominable human being, he wasn't a cartoon villain. He did also do some good things. He was a big proponent of Hitler's anti-smoking campaign. Yeah, Hitler's anti-smoking campaign. You can condemn Reiter, you can condemn Hitler, you can condemn Nazi Germany whilst saying that reducing smoking in the population is a good thing. It's not a case of balancing. It's a difficulty with how we look back on people in history. And I think that that's the very sharp end of a much wider point of how we look at individuals throughout history who have done atrocious things. This statue of a 17th century slave trade owner, Edward Coulson in Bristol, stands no more. Edward Coulson was a big part of Bristol's history and heritage, allegedly, and he was a very rich philanthropist who gave lots of money to build schools and hospitals and all sorts of other things, money that he had gained through the slave trade. And the statue was there to honour him as a philanthropist, but was toppled by Black Lives Matter protesters because he made this money as a slave trader. Protesters then dragged it through the street to the harbour. And this polarises some people. Some people on one side say he was a philanthropist. He did a lot of good at the time. And yeah, he traded slaves, which is an atrocious thing to do. But it was sadly part of the history of the time. On the other side of the scales, people say, well, he traded slaves. We should not be putting up statues of people who traded slaves. Full stop. Now, I don't want to get too much into that, but it is possible that both of those things could be true. Mr. Rees, do you support the police in their search for those responsible for criminal damage, or do you support the tearing down of this statue? Well, putting up those kind of binary options really doesn't help us navigate a complicated world, Krishnan. I don't know how this pans out and fits together, but what I do know is that if we're going to move forward as a society, we need a way of interpreting all of this and not painting him as either an exclusive hero or villain. It's possible to look at it and say, he was a slave trader. We mustn't be building statues. We mustn't be honoring and celebrating people who traded slaves. And also we can still say, he was part of the time. He made schools, he made hospitals. That does not, not justify the atrocities that were committed. But the atrocities that were committed don't erase the other things that he did. I don't know how to go about figuring that out. But I know that they don't cancel each other out. We shouldn't be celebrating Colston statues. There was a gorilla statue that was put up on the plinth, actually, which was quite cool. That was taken down fairly swiftly by the council, I think. But 
maybe, for the time being at least, what we need is an empty plinth to be able to try and grapple with the past. Black lives matter. We need to strive for a better and fairer world for all of us. That does involve going back and reappraising and reinterpreting history, but it doesn't involve rewriting or forgetting history. That's just my thoughts anyway. I hope you found it interesting and maybe a little bit of food for thought if nothing else. Let me know what you think in the comments below. Remember, if you like the video, subscribe to the channel, click the like button and share the links. And I'll see you next week.